Welcome to the Impact Multiplier CEO Podcast. If you're a chief executive, or if you think like one, and you want to create exponentially greater impact, then this show is for you. My name is Richard Metcalf, founder of X Quadrant. I coach some of the most successful and impressive CEOs and executive teams on the planet and help them achieve extraordinary results. And no matter how successful you've been in the past, there's always a whole new level of impact available to you. So if you're ready to play a bigger game than ever before, I invite you to join us and become an Impact Multiplier CEO. In this episode of the podcast, I speak with James Bain, who is the CEO of Worldline UK and Ireland. Uh, James is a really interesting and very quotable person, as you'll find out. He has plenty of thoughts, both on his own journey, which took him from uh, working in Burger King to CEO of an electronic payments company, uh, that leads him to reject uh, innovation as an idea and has other ideas instead about what we should be focusing on. really interesting thoughts about how to foster creativity and disruptive thinking, uh, even when your whole organization is in lockdown and working remotely. Um, And then also about how he, as a high-performing leader, wants to create a whole new level of impact and significance in the world and leave a legacy. So this is an interesting, thought-provoking, and sometimes inspiring conversation. So enjoy this conversation with James Bain. Hi, James. Morning. Hi. Hey, it's great to um, have you here on the podcast. Thanks for joining me today. No, it's a pleasure, Richard. Good to be here. So, um, James, you know, you're the CEO of World Line UK and Ireland. Um, so you've got a, a really interesting background. And it sounds like you've been doing some interesting things, especially perhaps over the last year uh, as, as kind of COVID hit and everyone's had to learn to work differently. Uh, so we'll dive into that um, and we'll get into as well your journey, what's what's created the impact that you've had in your career um, and, and what are some of the lessons that we can draw out of that. But first, before we, we do that, can you perhaps give us that quick elevator pitch, you know, of uh, who you are, what, what Worldline does and just a little bit of your journey from where you started into that CEO role? Yeah, no problem at all. So um I started my, I guess I'd say my working life in a, in a Burger King um, through a cheese packing factory and putting up marquees in my teenage years. I then uh, managed pubs and nightclubs for bus taverns and finished that once I worked out. It was 80 hours a week for not much back. <laughs> and then I, I started with Virgin Trains in 1999 um, at the point of rail privatisation in the UK. And, you know, Virgin is, everyone is aware of, of the Virgin brand and Richard Branson, particularly the founder of the Virgin brand. And that took me through to 2007. And I learned so much being part of that organization and that culture. Um, I then was cheapied to uh, Arriva um, as part of a a rail franchise move in the UK. And I was there till uh, late 2009. And I started with Atos Origin uh, on a IT tech services uh, supply side in February, 2010. So, I've just passed 11 years. Um, As you said, Richard, I'm now the CEO for Worldline in the UK and Ireland. Worldline is a global payments company. Um, We were spun out of Atos uh, in 2013, and we've been on a journey since then, and we're now a completely separate organisation. And it's a big organisation, right? It's it's big. It's surprisingly big. It it is big. There's around about 20,000 people. Uh, employed globally, uh, acquisition closed last year of Ingenico, um, which took a, will take us around about five and a half billion euros per annum of, of revenue line. Um, floated in France on the on the Euronext, we're a French company at heart, um, headquartered in Paris, but with operations in seventy to eighty countries around the world. Nice, so that, that's me. Great, and, um, and we'll, we'll dive into some of the things that you've been doing in, you know, in Worldline uh, in the UK in, in a second. Um, but if you just step back at that whole journey, right, from you know, say, work starting at Burger King, um, you know, through Virgin, you know, obviously an iconic brand, um, uh, through you know, into the world of payments. Uh, what would be, you know, what's your secret sauce, right? What would be the couple of things? 
that have propelled you forward, right? Have allowed you to make an impact in those different organizations? I think from, you know, if I reflect back on my younger self, um, probably blind faith and a touch of arrogance for those people that, that knew me back then, if I'm perfectly honest. Um, and as with everything in life, as you get older, you learn and inevitably you learn more from your mistakes than you ever do from your successes. And, you know, I've made mistakes through that time and I've learned from those mistakes. The, the secret sauce, I guess, is, you know, be brave, um, be bold and, and, you know, don't be afraid to take the next step because mm. the next step is the next step on the journey and if you don't take it the journey stops so um you know the mistakes really help me in terms of crystallizing what to do with my own career and how to work going forward and is there an example of um like when have you had to be brave or bold um so uh when i worked um at Arriva, i uh came up with a concept to um, create an online rail booking engine, um, ticket selling engine that would um, compete with uh, trainline.com, who I'm sure most people mm -hmm. are aware of in the UK. Uh, it's called redspothanky.com. Um, I didn't go about that the right way. Inevitably, there were some you know, challenges around that. And you know, it, it, in terms of the plans and the, what I wanted to do, I should have been more open with people around me at that point in time. And it caused some challenges through Christmas 2009 through to early 2010. And that was a big, big, big lesson for me around openness and honesty. So more open in terms of what, expressing the vision? Uh, the, expressing what I was wanting to do and not, not doing it in a cloak and dagger way, if I'm perfectly honest. Right. Um, you know, and, uh, and allowing you know, the discussion and the debate to flow with where I was at the time compared to where I wanted to go in the future. Um, you know, being open and honest with people up front allows progress to happen. Um, mm. Yeah, so you, you could have, we're trying to do things a bit by yourself, was that? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. 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 You could call it skunk works, I think. Skunk works, yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah, so kind of trying to build your own project rather than kind of uh, build that coalition of... Yeah people even if it goes slower yeah it often it does yeah yeah absolutely yeah that's been a recurring theme actually in this season this whole idea of you have to slow down which yeah. is frustrating when you have a vision but <laughs> it's necessary yeah, definitely definitely um so great so hearing yeah so that kind of question about being bold being brave anything else would you say that's kind of taken you forward or has it really been those bold moves one after the other I think from my own personal perspective, and it is a very personal one, um, I don't have a degree. Um, I don't even have an HND. I, I managed not to pass that as well. Um, I have some very ropey A levels. Um, I did manage to get GCSEs, you know, all these English qualifications, mm -hmm. uh, British qualifications. And I think in my, you know, I know in my early career, I, there was always a bit of a chip on the shoulder about not being uh, graduated, not having degrees. Mm and that always that you know, fired a fight for want of a better term mm. in terms of you know pushing myself forward and pushing myself harder so you know there was that kind of um self-inflicted competition on myself mm. <laughs> no one else's issue it was mine yeah it's a drive right that's yeah. really where the drive came yeah, from absolutely absolutely i've seen that in different ways you know one of my um clients lost his father at a very, very early age, you know, and actually when he looks back, it created in him, not necessarily entirely healthily actually, but, you know, um, because it created a, a, a really intensive drive to like, life is not safe, therefore I need to succeed, you know? And now this is later on in life, he's kind of having to, you know, he's addressed that and perhaps found a more, you know, balanced way of living. But it, the positive side was, you know, he had an incredible, career right he managed to create you know he, he propelled himself forward because there was that inner fire that yeah. i need to make this work which was interesting yeah similar i had a similar experience i mean i, I lost my father when i was just under 30 um mm -hmm. and i had three children all under the age of three um at that point in time and you know when i when i reflect back that moment in 2000 and uh, 2005 that also added fuel to what was already there from a, a drive mm. perspective mm. because Right. Um, 
life is precious time doesn't stop no you know, to make the most of it no well i i don't i don't do share this i don't i don't always share it but i do share it which is you know that yeah my again my mother died um at age 59 um and it definitely puts thing you know you definitely go okay what's the impact that i am here to make you know what do i want to look back on and you know what's the chapter I want to write and you realize you can't wait for retirement to do all those things you have to create the impact now um I used to joke when I left Cisco that I said I said I don't want to tell my grandchildren that I just helped increase at and T's EBITDA margin by 0.1 percent or whatever it would be on the projects that I was working on nothing wrong with that right it's all good creating financial yeah, results yeah. is good but yeah. it doesn't want to be the whole story yeah, absolutely. And that's where I kind of took me on my own journey to say, well, what's the impact I want to make and with whom? Yeah. Which led to my, you know, this business. Uh, I can empathize with that. Yeah. So well, let's just move on. What about the dark side? Well, we've talked about some of those perhaps, but like, you know, what's what things have caused you to stumble as a result of that bravery and boldness? I mean, we did obviously talk about that bringing people with it with you. That might be one. Is there anything else that you felt you had to learn perhaps the hard way on um, the journey? speed so there is a uh, for me there's an optimal speed mm-hmm. to be gained um going helter skelter at light speed mm. isn't always the best answer to get to the end or to get to where you want to go fastest mm. and it, the i guess i'd say calibration of that dream mm. and where you want to get to versus the reality of how to get there and inevitably along the journey, life changes. You know, there's, a, there's only 12 months, yeah, 12 months ago, I, you know, I don't think you'd have got a bookie to take a market on being locked down in 12 months. I just, you know, it, it yeah. wasn't going to happen. Um, so life changes and it's that ability to, you know, try and understand what may happen, but when it does happen, react in the you know in the right way or the best way possible with what you know to, to keep the journey going because no journey is a straight line and for me yeah. the the speed element was key in my younger days i wanted it all done within the next 30 seconds and you know yeah. perfect age and experience tells you that's not true yes yeah yeah it's interesting the um the whole thing around uh yeah speed and, and navigating obstacles you know is definitely one that i'm i'm hearing and um yeah, I often say there's a time for strategy and a time for execution, which means you know you, it's quite good to kind of lock and load, and then be able to f- focus. But then, of course, when an obstacle does blow up, you then need to say, is my initial strategy still valid? Do I continue or do I need to regroup? Mm-hmm. Um, um, but you're right, that whole thing of taking people with you, and um, it's better to keep it going forward rather than trying to set yourself unrealistic ambitions that end up making you feel that you're playing a losing game. That's the other danger. You know, if like, I know earlier on in me, in my own career, it was like, as soon as I had the vision, I, I was frustrated that I wasn't there yet. Uh, and of course that just sets you up for constant failure in a sense of nothing's ever enough because there's always more to go. And when you actually start to celebrate the progress, you can relax a bit more into the journey and actually then things probably go faster and simpler. But definitely acknowledging progress. And you know, if I reflect on the last 12 months, I. I became the CEO on the 2nd of March, 2020, with a strategy mm. that was uh, going right, let's say, for want of a better term, mm. you know, planned out, obviously, in my view, from perfection. Um, by the 13th of March, the country was coming into lockdown. By the 22nd of March, it was locked down. Yeah. So, you know, I didn't even get two weeks at it. And then, absolutely, we were in the UK into you know, furlough, lockdown, social distancing, words we'd never yeah. heard. And we had to change our strategy and change it quickly in order to react. So the last 12 months have brought all of that, you know, into view very sharply. Yeah, so let's dive into this. I think this is a really interesting area. I know as we were, you know, we were talking before around this whole question that, you know, creativity is really important for you. And you have some interesting perspectives about innovation. Do you want to just share that? Like, how do you see innovation? Is that important? Yeah, you know, I, I have a phrase for it. I won't use it here um, because it's a bit of an X-rated phrase. Um, but I don't, I don't necessarily, or not necessarily, I don't believe in innovation. Innovation is something that 
as people, we acknowledge with hindsight and rose tinted spectacles because mm -hmm. something has worked and been positive. For me, all innovation starts with invention. It starts with an idea or it starts with an evolution of idea. We never celebrate the, uh, the you know, bad ideas for want of a better term, the failed ideas. They get mm. consigned to the trash can of history and erased from our memories for the positive outcome. Because as humans, we like, we love, we need the positivity. Mm. So for me with um, the teams and the people that you know, work, we work together, we, we focus on invention, we focus on creativity. Mm. Our ultimate focus, even though we're a, a you know, payments company that works with other businesses, not consumers, our ultimate focus is consumers, our ultimate focus is human beings. That's where we start all of our thinking from, because that's mm. where the world works from. Yeah, that's really interesting. So, so tell me a bit more about that. How, you know, what does creativity mean for you? How do you know when you're doing it? Like, what's, you know, what are you, what are you actually trying to get people to do? Is everybody creative? I mean, do you? No. So, you know, we're all different, aren't we? Um, which is what brings you know, the value and the progress that, that we experience uh, as people, we are, some of us are more creative than others, others. Some of us may be seen as, you know, complete lunatics for our creativity and others may be seen as, um, you know, maybe slow and, uh, and um, nervous about change, but that's just due to personality traits. The mix of creative people and I guess I would say less creative people is what makes creativity happen. Because if you just left it to the creative people, nothing would ever get delivered. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, if, so we have to have the mix. Um, and for me, creativity, as I said, is led by focus on human beings and, and really importantly, being human. Mm. And it's what do we need for the world we're going to live in? but the world we want to create and the world we want to leave behind for our, um, you know, our mm. children, their children and so on. Mm. And, you know, a key focus for us in the strategy that we've, we've got and continue to have is around social mobility. Um, it is about what do we do with our products and services that ensures there's equality and inclusiveness across society. Now we're a digital payment company, mm. Unfortunately and sadly, there are people who don't even have bank accounts. Absolutely. So, you know, how do we engage with society to make sure that our services benefits everybody? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, for me, leading the team, I really push them to think about people and the being human element mm -hmm. and then work from that point around creativity. Hello, it's Richard here with a quick interlude. These conversations are all about upgrading how you think about creating impact. So here's a resource to help you do just that whilst staying fast and focused. The CEO's checklist for challenging times is a quick way to enhance your thinking and detect blind spots, even when things are moving incredibly fast and you're not sure what's gonna happen next. You can get this powerful checklist of 17 world-class strategies by heading to xquadrant.com forward slash go forward slash challenging times checklist with a hyphen between each of those three last words. Now, back to the conversation. Yeah, I love that. That creates that sense of purpose, right? When we're actually doing something that improves the lives of other people, yeah. that's where we get our purpose from. You can't get a, you know, yeah. nobody gets out of bed just to increase shareholder value, right? I mean, on, on an abstract term, right? It's all about whose life can I make better? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And um, and I know you you you've been, we've talked to or you you mentioned to me before that um, that one of the things you've been able to do, especially in the last year since you took over as as, as the CEO in, in the UK and Ireland, you you've been able to get teams working um, together across teams. Creativity, uh, cre creatively, because I, and I think this is amazing because I speak with a lot of, of execs and one of their recurrent pain points in a world where there's a lot of remote working, nobody seeing each other, people can't travel, has been, you know, even the team, they're, they're kind of doing okay by themselves. 
they're getting together and having their team meetings and their team cocktails or whatever they want to do. You know, so they're kind of okay. Um, but we're seeing a real lack of you know, everyone's doing very transactional, repetitive stuff. They're not being creative. And certainly working across those teams is really hard because there's not the corridor conversations and the quick get together. So that's all a long way of saying, uh, what, what have you found, right? How have you found, you know, what have been some of your, um, some of the ways in which you've helped people across different teams come together creatively to innovate or to invent, as we should say. So what we've, uh, thank you. Um, what we've, um, what we've done is we have a weekly on a Monday morning, half nine uh, call for every single person in the organisation. Um, you know, corporately, historically, in the world, those calls might have been, you know, present this, present that. We're, we've turned them into interactive sessions. Mm -hmm. um, we have specific focuses, um, no pun intended with what we're doing here. We do specific Zooms on, on different aspects of the business. We bring in external advice, um, external guidance. And this isn't just from technology and it's not from a market study. It's not from a return on investment. It's not from a you know, Gartner quadrant or anything like that. We, we also bring in human support so you know we do a lot of work with an organization called changing minds um from a clinical psychological uh, perspective around so we've done sessions for example mm -hmm. around anxiety we've done sessions around uh, supporting line managers work with their teams we've done um, sessions around resilience um the other aspect that we do is um we change the organization so historically I believed we were you know, slightly siloed in our approach. So we would mm. have people that would work on payment solutions for maybe hospitality. We also had people working on payment solutions for the rail industry. It doesn't matter if it's a hotel room or a rail ticket. It's a payment solution for a human being to buy a service. And we brought all of the teams together. And we've now got experience from the rail side helping hospitality and experience mm hospitality side helping the rail side yeah. and you know we might a we're managing to generate different uh solutions that will help in a post-covid world by bringing those two experiences together right nice it's really really interesting and whilst it might sound simple that oh, yeah well of course they're the same they're not the same there are slight nuances and there's always learning to be had um, and so, so and so did you actually was this really an organizational literally you just combine the teams and put them right. on a new manager yeah we yeah. we combined the teams um we got rid of some of the silos that were there um we've introduced people to each other who've worked in the same organization for seven years and never met each other yeah and um, for example the the weekly calls that we do we do them on zoom so everyone's cameras can be on or off it's a choice um, but I've noticed over the year, more people's cameras have become on mm. rather than off. As Because yeah. we all get used to it. I mean, we're British. Yeah. We're all conscious about it to start with. Um, <laughs> but but now it's, you know, it, it's, it's the normal. Um, and then with some of our investments, we've been hard on them, if I'm perfectly honest. We've been deliberate. There is stuff that historically we might have done that we're not mm. doing. Right. specifically focused around the consumer and you know what we can do and what we can build for a post-covid world for the consumer mm. so that's how we've done it really interesting and the other thing i thought would be great just to get your your thoughts on is um you know is this question of what what needs to be in place for creativity because i know you, you talked about um, for you, creativity is which is ideally really disruptive, right? It's not, you know, you, you look, you're shooting for something that really makes a difference, right? Rather than a, a tiny incremental improvement. And so not every organization manages to do that. So what do you find, you know, what have you had to put in place to encourage that creativity? So the, the biggest thing for me that we're doing, and it is a journey, it's not a, it's not a one-shot solution, um, is in bringing in the concept of psychological safety. So the, there's three tenants around that, which is, you know, setting the stage, which is almost a vision, framing the work, which drops into, you know, more detail about the how. Mm -hmm. But the most important part is clarifying the boundaries. 
um you know we all need boundaries that's how society works yeah. and you know there are consequences for breaching boundaries but there's also um clarity of why boundaries are there mm. and this kind of psychological safety you know was stumbled on by google i think in 2007 2008 so you mm. know and again the invention part wasn't me um you know i have taken what google stumbled over and when we look at you know the likes of google pixar is another one mm. uh, they have a, a a group internally that um every time they produce a new film this group critiques the film and pulls out the bad stuff or what they thinks the bad stuff and it iterates it round. but it's done in an environment where everyone's voice can be heard there is no right or wrong answer mm. it's clear what the boundaries are and what the outcome needs to be and it's um, multifunctional in terms of people from across the organization that get involved and that drives progress and that, you know i'm a complete advocate for this concept of psychological safety it's not just a fluffy pink clouds blue sky no. world it, it is a tenant that if we ingrain it in our cultures strongly enough it frees invention and creativity because it allows challenge and it gets rid of the perceived hierarchical nature of organization charts yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting, right? Because you're right. I mean, actually, the fluffy stuff, if you, as you described it, is actually surprisingly toxic, right? Because a lot of people have gone away from this idea of I need to, you know, of this domineering leader. I don't be that jerk, you know, who who's always just pushing these people down, and they go the other way. Or perhaps naturally, they have a natural propensity, which is fine as well. We all have our natural propensities, one way or the other. But their natural propensity is not to dominate their people. It's to insulate them from reality uh, and to not have the hard conversations and not show the gap between reality and where we need to be, uh, not pull up bad behavior or things that are not, you know, that are toxic or whatever. And so you create on the surface, it all feels nice. Nobody's a arguing with each other but actually things are not being said and that does not create that creates this insulation culture where um people say what is expected to be said uh, and the real things are not put on the table and i think for that you need to have this you need to have quite strong relationships in place and you need to have this uh agreement to and uh, commitment to bring challenge which yeah. is kind of what I guess you're saying here. No, absolutely. And, you know, we all have different personalities and it's understanding each person's personality in the team or the teams mm. and, you know, having a, a base understanding of how that personality type works. And, you know, th there is work that can be done around that. There's training programs, there's investment that, that, mm. that we make along that journey. And, you know, we are going to do it with our whole senior management team of around about 50 people um once we're allowed to do it in a in a physical environment because that's yeah. how it really works and I, I truly believe that by driving for a culture that has psychological safety ingrained into it mm. will bring progress and will deliver you know significant progress and disruption and you know the, the world progresses because of disruption because yeah. of change it doesn't mm. progress by you know, retaining the status quo. Mm. Yeah, I love that the world. You've got some good um, quotes here, James. Uh, I've been trying to note some of them down, but yeah, the world progresses because of disruption is another another good one. So you're a quotable person. I like this. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a few. I think I've got the world progresses because of disruption. Um, yeah, nothing is innovated. Um, um, the mix of creative and non-creative people is what makes creativity happen. I think there's some really great uh, nuggets in here. So thank you for this. Let's kind of go wrap up with just like getting a little bit, um, a little bit vulnerable, a little bit thinking about the future, right? You know, you've kind of, you know, made it to here. You're running this, um, you know, this, this large uh, organization uh, in the UK. Um, you know, what's, now what's your growth, right? Where, where's the stretch for you that's going to take you forward so for me it is about what can i do that makes an impact for future generations so you know um i didn't share this uh, what we discussed earlier but um i had covid last year i had covid in may mm. and my wife's a type 1 diabetic she was hospitalized four times last year 
with COVID and my 15 year old son also had COVID in May with an oxygen percentage of 84 in an ambulance. Well, somebody in my has a wife also with type one diabetes. Um, yeah, I know where you're coming from. So, so yeah. that, that really brings a focus on mortality. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you do, if we'd done this interview 12 months ago, you'd have had a different response to the response I think you're about to get. Mm. I'm perfectly honest. So, you know, I don't want to be the richest man in the graveyard, um, basically. Yeah. And it's what, what can I do with the position that I've got to, the teams that I work with, the charities that I support, the life that I lead, mm. that leaves a better world for, you know, the generations that are to come. Yeah. We talked about social mobility. Um, I work with a charity called the Railway Children um, who look after disadvantaged children in the UK, East Africa and Kenya. Um, but more importantly, the work that we do and the solutions that we build, how are they going to help the future world? So I've talked about social mm. mobility. We must not forget the climate aspect as well. I think the last 12 months has helped the climate because of the complete stop of or almost stop mm. of air travel, for example. And I'm not picking on the yeah. air industry because there's still massive CO2 generators that continue to go. But social mobility, people who are less fortunate than myself and the health of the planet are, you know, at, at my front mm. of mind. So for me, you know, I've got this role right now. I'm still ambitious. That said, uh, I turn 46 next month. So, you know, I am at that point now where time is short going forward compared to the time that, you know, mm. behind. Yeah. I really want to make the most of each day. And, you know, with the work that I do, as I've said, what we focus on around human beings, social mobility, and from the, mm. the, the non-work aspect, it's what else can I do that helps society and the planet or my little small tiny 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 mm. action can help them help the planet for future generations and that's that's really what drives me and that's more where my head is now i think if you'd asked me 12 months ago mm. uh, you might have got a more technologically driven type sort of answer um i'm never going to be an elon musk or jeff bezos or anything like that um and i'm probably too old for that now anyway but you know, I, I just want to do my bit. Yeah, this. Um, thank you for being, you know, honest. I think this is great. I, what I hear is, um, first of all, it reminds me of a, uh, a lyric by a, a rock band that I used to like. I still like when I was uh, very young, actually. But a, the rock band Rush, Canadian rock band Rush, they had a lyric which was, "We know that we're only immortal for a limited time," and uh, I think that point is suddenly going actually. Um, it's not infinite right what am i gonna you know this life is not infinite what are we gonna you know what do i want to uh, generate and create and then it's this other idea if i have a little tool i use with my clients which is um um time and space so you've got you know today this week this month all the rest of it all the way up to you know generations and then you've got me my family you know blah 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 all the way up to the world you know, so you go through these different areas. And so, you know, you can kind of start to look at, well, where, what would happen if I was to focus somewhere else? So like, I might be focusing on my company this quarter, but what would I do if I focus on my company in 10 years or this industry in the next five years or this world in my generation, you know, my lifetime, or, um, you know, you can play all sorts of things, you know, my family in multiple generations, you can like move around on this chart and start to realize there's whole areas that we haven't attended to we don't have to attend to everything but i think it kind of opens up perspectives which is kind of what i'm hearing that you're kind of going into now yeah absolutely time absolutely fascinates me and i talk to my my teams and the guys about it all the time you know and it doesn't stop the seconds the minutes the hours the days the weeks the months the years they go at the same velocity yeah and it's how do you make the most of that and what as you say richard what angles do you look at it from and what perspectives do you bring it's it's so important yeah beautiful so um james it's been a fantastic um thought-provoking conversation if people want to find out a bit more about you uh, or about worldline you know what should they do um well you can you can reach me on linkedin um you can uh, drop me an email um 
james.bain at worldline.com and I'm you know happy to talk. Um, and if you if you look at my LinkedIn profile, there's some pieces I've written over the last year or so on there as well. So you know. Great. I'll put the I'll put the link for that into the show notes. Um, that's really anyway. Really great to speak, James. And I think you've shared some great quotable quotes. Uh, yeah, already around. Yeah, I mean around. Yeah, you know, purpose. Right. We've talked about um, around creativity and innovation. Uh, we've talked around um, psychological safety and, and trust. Um, you know, and we've um, talked about being bold, right? And 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 uh, moving forward and finding the right speed to move forward. So I think there's a whole load of valuable topics that we've touched on today. So thanks again, and uh, hopefully speak soon. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Now let's talk about you. When you're in top leadership, when you're in the biggest role of your career, who supports you at a deep level as you lead others? Who helps you multiply your impact and get to the next level? If you're ready to learn more about our content, our coaching, and our community, then visit us at xquadrant.com.